hello, everyone, um, and thank you much for joining us here this morning. Uh, we are extremely excited to have Matt Klein, Michael Pettis, and Adam Tews here uh, in person, or rather in virtual person. Um, I'm Michael Steins. I'm the executive director of the Jane Family Institute, uh, which is a New York City-based applied research organization uh, in the social sciences founded by Bob Jane. Uh, we work on guaranteed income, digital ethics and governance, and higher education finance, among other portfolios. Uh, and I'm so pleased to have so many of you here today. The uh, interest in the event has been uh, enormous. Uh, we have fairly regular events like this, which you'll see listed in our newsletter. And when we're not working remotely, we have a speaker series in our Manhattan office. Uh, so please take us this, this as an invitation to join us for those in the future. Uh, Jack, uh, I will pass it to you now. Uh, thank you again, everyone, and thank you most of all to Jack for conceiving and making this event possible, to Matt, uh, Michael, and Adam for calling in each at their respective times. Thanks. Thanks, Michael. Um, yes, thank you all so much for coming. As Michael said, my name is Jack. I work at JFI, um, and I run our web publication, The Phenomenal World, which will be doing some documentation of this event next week. I'm really excited to have everybody here with us today. We have people calling in from uh, truly all over the world. I know there's folks from US, Canada, China, the UK, Germany, South Africa, Brazil, Argentina, um, and many more places, which I'm particularly glad about given the subject of the discussion today. We're very lucky to have Michael Pettis, Matthew Klein, and Adam Tews here. Um, thanks especially to Michael and Matt for submitting to Eastern Time and joining us late in Beijing and early in San Francisco. Um, as you know, we're all here to talk about trade wars or class wars, which just came out in the US on May 19th. The way this will run is I will say a few housekeeping items, um, very briefly introduce the three discussants and then let them talk for about 45 minutes, at which time we'll take questions from the audience I recommend that you save your questions and tell that time, and then I'll invite people to just write their uh, questions in one sentence um, in the chat, please be economical. Um, and then I'll call on you, enable your mic so you can ask the question. Um, we're also simultaneously streaming this on YouTube. So if you have friends or colleagues who are unable to join here, please direct them um, to the YouTube page where they can watch it. I'm just gonna paste that into the chat quickly here. Um, and the final piece of housekeeping is that if you have not yet gotten a copy of this book, I strongly encourage you to do so through Yale University Press. We have a discount code that works in the UK and US shops. Um, the code is Y-E-T-W-C, which I will write here again. Um, and that's the end of the housekeeping, um, except to just ask everyone to please be patient if any technical difficulties arise over the next hour due to bandwidth and other problems. Um, I'm very excited, again, uh, to be doing this. Trade Wars or Class Wars is an incredibly important book. I've been anticipating it for several months, and I know many on the line have been as well. And we're thrilled to be able to have Matt, Michael, and Adam here to introduce us to its arguments and perhaps talk through its implications. Um, for understanding both the history of the global economy and our current moment of pandemic-induced turbulence. It is Thursday, which means in the U.S. we've just woken up to um, what is now the routine horror of new jobless claims. And I think this book is extraordinarily useful for grounding our understanding of the present crises. Um, it takes a panoramic view of the global economy over the course of its development and recasts many familiar episodes of political economic conflict through the clarifying lens of the balance of payments. I think uh, Michael Pettis's writing on China and the balance of payments has been uh, quite likely very influential for many people on the line. And it's exciting to see the fruits of his work with Matt on a book that expounds that view with um, such clarity, accessibility, and force, um, all led by a Hobson epigraph. Um, the relationship between the themes and arguments in this book and Adam Tooze's work from statistics in the German state through to crashed, I think for this audience uh, do not require much elaboration. So suffice it to say that I can't think of better interlocutors for this work. And I'm really thrilled that Adam was excited to talk through the book with Matt and Michael. Um, so in the interest of time, I'll just truncate these brief bios. Um, 
and say Adam Tews, as we all know, is a history professor and director of the European Institute at Columbia University, is the author of many incredible books, the latest of which is Crashed, How a Decade of Financial Crises Changed the World. And he's currently at work on a history of the climate crisis. Michael Pettis is a senior fellow at the Carnegie Tsinghua Center for Global Policy and a finance professor at Peking University. He is the author of several books, including The Great Rebalancing, Trade, Conflict, and The Perilous Road Ahead for the World Economy. And finally, Matthew Klein is the economics commentator at Barron's. He previously wrote for the Financial Times, Bloomberg, and The Economist. Um, so without further ado, oh, I'm seeing we're having some echo problems. See if that fixed it. I think. Okay. Without further ado, I will now um, pass it off to Adam, who will uh, start the discussion. Thank you again, all, very, very, very much for coming. Uh, excellent. Thank you. Thank you, Michael. Thank you, Jack, for that introduction. Um, uh, I think we may have some feedback. If it's possible, Michael, that you could put on earphones, that often helps. But, Sorry, uh, I don't. I don't have earphones. Okay, um, we'll we'll I'll do what mute. we can. What yeah. we can do is uh, can I'll do. I'll just do my best to mute Michael when when you're not talking and keep an eye on it. So hopefully there won't be any delays or echoes. Excellent. Well, well, it really is a, a great pleasure to to talk about this book with Michael and and Matt. Um, it, it it really is a book without exaggeration that everyone should read. Um, it's it's profoundly provocative. Not everyone is going to agree with everything uh, or its implications, but really we all need to engage with the arguments being offered here. Um, the shock value of the book, I think, starts with the, the title, and that's what I wanted to put my first question to Michael and Matthew about. I'm going to try and stand as far away uh, uh, as I can and to allow them to talk as much as possible about the theses of the book. And, and and it's really in this juxtaposition that, that you've, you've you've set up in this title. Um, trade wars are class wars. Um, let's just bracket trade wars for a minute because I think most of us have a sense that we know what the trade wars are. Though in the book, in fact, you don't get very much into the details. And if we have time at the end, I'd like to come back to exactly how you see the linkage working. But it's really the second half of the title and the thing that joins the verb that joins them together that I really want to focus on just to get us going because I think this really is the, the shock of the book. Class wars, I mean, this is, this is big, powerful language uh, with a historical legacy. And not class wars cause trade wars or class wars trigger or create the context for, but are, class wars are, or trade wars are class wars. The, a, almost a statement of, of identity. Um, can you elaborate on this for us? Uh, what was the thinking behind this juxtaposition? What are your inspirations? Um, what, if you like, is the theoretical framework um, which articulates that statement of identity? Trade wars are class wars. Um, uh. Well, if if um, if if I'm you know credit where where credits due, I'm pretty sure Matt came up with that title. But at first, it was it was really the title. Title. It was sort of the way we referred to the book uh, uh, among ourselves. Uh, and 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 I think I think the reason is because we were very concerned about uh, how people would read read that, and, and and we were really worried about the implications of class war, what, whether it would color people's per perception of our basic argument. Uh, but in the end, it was just very, was very hard to come up with, I think, a better title for that. And I remember at one point writing to that and saying, you know, we might, you know, we might as well use title because I, I can't think of a, of a, of a, a punchier, you know, more explicit, explicit title than that and agreed. And, and, and so um, that's, why, that's why we have the title. I'm, I'm still a little bit concerned that people dismiss it as a, you know, a, a class, class war. Our, 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 our argument is, I think, pretty straight, straightforward, and that is that Trade, trade and certainly trade, trade conflicts in the modern era um, don't really reflect um, um, uh, uh, difference, differences in the cost of production. What they really reflect is this difference in, 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 in savings and balances. They primarily reflect savings and balances, with themselves primarily driven by the uh, distortions in the distribution of income. So our, our argument is the reason we have trade wars is because we have 
persistent distant trade balances. A reason, the reason we have persistent trade imbalances is because in a, because in enough countries, income, income is distributed in such a way that uh, workers or so the middle class, ordinary households within that country simply c- cannot consume enough of what they, what they produce. And therefore, that, that leads to imbalances, which then, because they persist, lead, lead to a conflict. Just to follow up a little bit on, on what Michael was saying, I mean, it's interesting how you can take what are, in many ways, very straightforward, true by definition statements about the nature of the global economy and financial system. And if you just tie them together in the right order, you end up with something that actually has a very radical conclusions or radical sounding conclusions. And sort of part of the, you know, that's in some ways sort of the, the, the point of the, of the title also is, you know, it, it is, you know, an in your face title and it seems like it's very radical and provocative. But as you heard Michael's explanation, this is all basically, you know, these are all statements that are true by definition about, you know, how production and consumption and saving relate to each other and, you know, what has to be, you know, how the global system balances. It's just that it's worth going, you know, the extra step to say, these these aren't just sort of abstract concepts. These actually have real implications and, and causes that relate to, in many ways, the distribution of political and economic power. And that's really why we wanted to highlight. And this has an intellectual genealogy as well, right? So the, the book, has, as, as Jack noted, starts with a, a quote from Hobson, from Hobson on imperialism. Most people will know Hobson as the hidden more or less, well, it's in fact, frankly, acknowledged by Lenin, but as the ins- uh, the inspiration or the foil against which Lenin developed his theory of imperialism. You too explicitly acknowledge uh, the significance of Hobson. Um, does that help us to understand the, the politics implied by this, in, implied by the, uh, of this book? Because, you know, class war and the politics of class war and analysis of class war could, after all, lead one in a, in a direction that was, frankly, Marxist. This is the, you know, this is the terrain on which Marxist analysis is normally developed. So what is the, what is the significance of the, of the Hobson reference for you? So I think one thing that distinguishes Hobson from Lenin is the idea, I mean, Lenin's version of Hobson was that capitalism inevitably led to imperialism and that inevitably led to conflict between the capitalist powers and you know world war and so forth that wasn't hobson's actual argument his uh, his argument is more that there are particular problems in the distribution of income and purchasing power within the major european capitalist countries and that explained imperialism and so those are you know that's an important difference you know we're not saying that this is you know an inherent crisis of capitalism or anything like that this is this is a solvable problem using the kinds of tools that policymakers have used in the past um, you know, conventional sort of redistribution, welfare state type things. We're not saying you need to overthrow the capitalist system. So that's an important distinction from sort of the Marxist view. And I think Hobson's interpretation of this is really valuable, that there are sort of middle courses between overthrowing the entire system and doing nothing and tolerating the sort of, you know, exploitative international relationships. Mm. Uh, and risking their escalation into international right. conflict, right? That's exactly. the... That's the the connection. So really, in a sense, just to paint as a historian, I can't help myself. This is a sort of uh, a, a retro Keynesianism that turns out to be more radical than the 1930s Keynes in some ways, right? So it's a sort of, it's the opposite of the familiar Kalecki move where you move forward from Keynes to Kalecki into a understanding of Keynes economics infused by a Polish Marxism. And instead what you're doing is going backwards within the tradition of liberal radical thought to a Hobson to discover this kind of reformist critique, which is nevertheless very penetrating in its diagnosis of social structure and social power that opens that kind of reformist window, right? Because the book oscillates between, I think, uh, a devastating critique of structures as they are and the desire to open the possibility to reform, which we might well come on to at the end. Perhaps we can get into this more concretely if we look at the three case studies that you elaborate. In the book, you have two conceptual chapters which lay out the framework. Um, which I think might be best for people to digest in, 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 in the form of the text. But perhaps we can kind of illuminate the nature of your argument by looking at your take on China and Germany first and then the United States. You divide the world into the great surplus generators and the deficit country, the implicit, and this is a point we really need to move towards, the strong causal claim is that the imbalances are largely the result of social structural change in the surplus countries. So perhaps if we look at those two, we'll begin to really get into the nature of the book. Perhaps this is a question preeminently for Michael. Um, how, what do you see as the underlying driving logic 
behind the development of China towards its chronic surplus condition. Um, is this, do you see there a, a logic of class war at play within, within the, the, the Chinese regime? That's why, uh, that's why it's interesting to go back to Hobson, because what Hobson argued was um, the reason England and other European countries um, uh, uh, exported capital abroad and ran, their, ran the, the, uh, the, the, the resulting current account surpluses was not necessarily driven by military adventure or anything like that. The problem was that because income was distributed so badly with England, because you had incredibly high savings driven mostly by the fact that much of income um, uh, was concentrated among the fairly wealthy. And England had to export those excess savings and export the, the accompanying excess production. And imperialism was really a way of locking in markets for both of those exports. And, and, and what, what Hobson said that to me really, really um, was sort of the moment when I realized the, the comparisons with today is he said, you know, if you simply increase the wages of English workers to the point where they're able to consume most of what they produce, then there's really no need for any of this. There's no need to export savings. There's no need to, to, uh, to run current account surpluses. And England will be able to grow based on the growth of its domestic demand. And I think that was an incredibly important insight. And, um, and looking at what happened in China, you see very clearly the message. In China, we've seen uh, from the 1980s until basically 2011, 2012, when it bottomed out, was that while China was growing very rapidly in, in a sort of an equilibrium economy, rapid growth in GDP, rapid growth in productivity should be matched with an equivalently rapid growth in, um, in, in wages and in disposable household income. But that's not what we saw in China. We saw a number of mechanisms that implicitly transferred income from the household sector um, to businesses and to local governments, et cetera. And uh, there are many such mechanisms. And, and, and probably the most important was an extremely low interest rate, uh, a negative real interest rate for, for much of that period. And what a negative real interest rate does is basically it's a hidden tax on savings and it's a subsidy to borrowers. And the distribution within China was that ordinary households were net savers and businesses and the government were net borrowers. So it was a major transfer of income from ordinary households to businesses and to the government. Uh, there were other transfers and undervalued currency works the same way. Um, environmental degradation works the same way. There are a bunch of these hidden mechanisms, but the net effect was that the household share of GDP contracted during that three decade period to possibly the lowest we've ever seen in history. There's every once in a while in Arab oil sheikdom, you'll see a lower household rate when oil prices are high, but basically we can, uh, we can ignore them. Um, probably the lowest we've ever seen in history. And as a result, it was impossible for the uh, Chinese workers, Chinese households, to consume a significant portion of what they were producing. Now, this is not necessarily a bad thing, because in the early stages of this process, China, uh, after five decades of uh, anti-Japanese war, civil war, and Maoism, was hugely underinvested. So by constraining the ability of households to consume a significant share of what they have produced, uh, they effectively forced up the savings rate and channeled all of those savings into a massive investment program. China had the highest investment growth rate in history and the highest investment share of GDP in history, which are two different things, over the longest period of time in history. It's really extraordinary what happened in China. Now, is this a good thing or a bad thing? Well, as a developing country that was significantly underinvested, this was, a, this was exactly what the doctor ordered. You force up the savings rate, high savings result in very high investment levels, and the country grows so quickly that even with all of these hidden transfers, households did quite well. During this period, household income grew by roughly 7% a year, um, which most countries would kill for. The problem is that once you reach the point at which 
um, China has as much investment as it's able to absorb productively. Mm -hmm. And for a developing country, that's much, much lower than it is for an advanced economy because of a completely different set of institutions that govern the way uh, workers and businesses can absorb capital. Um, China reached that point, and once it reached that point, that's when we started to run into the problems of excess production. Because at that point, consumption was too low to drive growth. So China relied on high investment, which unfortunately was mostly non-productive investment, and on a high current account surplus in order to resolve its domestic imbalances. And so that was really the problem with China. And it's not, you know, Matt and I are not the first or even the only guys to have figured this out. In, in, in March 2007, the then premier of, uh, of uh, China's premier, mm -hmm. Wen Jiabao, gave a very famous speech in which he acknowledged the problem. And he promised that it would be the top priority of Beijing to rebalance demand domestically. Mm -hmm. Now, the point is that... Uh, uh, not only did they not rebalance the demand, the imbalances got worse over the next five years. And that was the period when we started hearing for the first time in China, you know, this idea of the, the so-called vested interests that are preventing uh, Beijing from implementing the policies that it wants to implement. And that's really where you get that distinction between ordinary Chinese and the local governments and the local elites. Because what China needs to do, and Beijing acknowledges this, is a major transfer of income from uh, local governments and local elites to ordinary workers. But that becomes the big political problem. That's very difficult to pull off. And that's the imbalance, which, is that, which are then exported to the rest of the world, mostly the US, in the form of a capital account deficit and a current account surplus. The story in Germany, which Matt will, uh, which Matt will discuss, is quite different, but ultimately it, 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 it results in exactly the same set of problems. So what's fascinating in the Chinese case, the way I hear you talking about it and the way I read it as well, is that there's a sort of dialectic in which a, just for sake of simplicity, let's say a national development strategy driven by the Communist Party elite as a project really of national sovereignty, as a bid for the establishment of China as a player in a hostile global system, succeeds in the way you've described, but then acquires a sociological dynamic, creates, as it were, these vested interests, creates powerful interests at different levels within China, at the global elite level, but also at the regional level. And of course, regions in China are the size of European nation states. So when we talk about the regional elite in Hubei, we're talking about the regional elite in something the size of France. They, those elites then become, as it were, a constraint on the autonomy of the regime. Uh, to some extent, the regime is entangled with them. To some extent, they are influencing and limiting the regime's action, as we've seen in COVID-19 as well. And, and that then, as it were, drives on into this frustration of repeatedly expressed reforming ambition, because the Chinese are good macroeconomists, they can see these imbalances, but it becomes very difficult then to unpick them and to change them, right? Um, so there's an interesting way, though, in which, as it were, the origin of this, and I, you know, as a historian, perhaps I'm overly fussy about these lines, but the origin of this seems to be not so much in a class struggle as in a national development strategy, which succeeds almost too much for its own good or succeeds to such a radical extent that it does indeed rear up a powerful, essentially some sort of version of a bourgeoisie, which the regime then struggles to master, if you like. Is that, is that a fair translation of the, of the story? That's, that's absolutely correct. Uh, correct, I would argue. The Chinese growth, growth model is not particularly Chinese. As I call it the, uh, the Gershon Krohn, Krohn growth model because it basically follows the set of recommendations as Alexander Gershon Krohn argued for, argued for a while back. Um, he, he said, uh, as I understand him, that there are basically two, two, two problems developed countries face. Uh, and and, and um, much, of his, much of his answer was based on his, on his understanding of U.S. development in, in the 19th century. He argued that first, first of all, developing countries have uh, insufficient savings to meet their investment needs. Why? Why? Because they are relative, relatively poor, because they have very high investment needs. So they must rely rely on foreign savings, savings in the case of uh, U.S., mostly English and Dutch savings in the 19th century, to, to get higher levels of, of, uh, of investment. 
Now, the problem with that is that relying on foreign savings, savings is risky, and, and, and even more so in the 20th century, where it was mostly in the form of debt, as opposed to, as to in the 19th century, mostly in the form of equity. So that was problem one, savings were too low. So the solu solution, you must force up, up the savings rate. And how do you do that? That well, in every country, it's three, it's the same. Country high savings rate, rate are simply countries in which ordinary households have a, rel a relatively low share of GDP. You reduce, reduce their share, the savings rate automatically goes up. The other problem he solved, he said, was that they tend to have a bad tra track record in uh in an invest, investing productive active, and needed infrastructure long-term term investments so his recommendation was you know as you applies the investment process, process. china is not the first, first country who did this so dozens of country did we did they would argue the soviet union, union followed this whole even germany and i remember reading your book on book on germany it occurred to me that germany also was an example of this growth model um and and uh, and uh, uh, Dan Roderick suggested that there are over two dozen countries since the Second World and World have had uh, mm -hmm. uh, investment-driven growth miracles. Uh, Brazil is a classic case. Uh, um, in, the, in the 1950s, 60s, and 70s, Japan through the 1980s, etc. So we so we've seen this before. It's a it's a very successful growth model. The problem is once you reach the point point where you can no longer simply increase investment at a, at a break pace. That's when you, that's when you have to do a different set of institutional reforms, yeah. and and yeah. uh, uh, um, uh, 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 wrote about this quite a lot. And his arg argument was that no country has ever has ever been able to do those reforms, usually because of political constraints and things like that. So China China is a very classic development problem. Excellent. What I might do in the interests of time, because we could really, this debate could go on for hours and it would be a pleasure if it did, but we should be disciplined. Let's pivot to the, to the next move in the book, uh, um, which isn't as arbitrary as it might seem, nor is it simply organized, I think, around the macroeconomic accounts, which show China and Germany to be two of the big drivers of macroeconomic imbalance. What's fascinating about this book, and I really recommend it also on this basis, is that it's really a history of the effects on the world economy of the end of communism in its classic form of the end of the Cold War. 1989 is a pivot, both from the point of view of events in China, but also from the point of view of the shock that this develops to the equilibrium of the West German growth model and the reintegration, then the reunification with East Germany, which is the beginning of the story in the chapter, which I believe is probably Matt's uh, chapter on on the German growth uh, story since since 1989. And here again, the, the, you, you tell a story of, of a fascinating shift, uh, now notorious, I think, and familiar perhaps to this audience about the, the break in the uh, late 1990s, this sudden demand for reform, quote unquote, the transformation in the labor market and welfare system. And again, for me, the question is, I, I understand, as it were, the consequences in terms of the shift in income distribution. And I understand the implications of that for the macroeconomic imbalances of Europe. And, you know, we've collectively all been puzzling away at this. But I have to say, having written Crash, I came away profoundly puzzled by what had happened in Germany. And um, reading your uh, excellent really is a short punchy summary of german history since 1989 it's pretty hard to be to recommend it to everyone teaching this kind of topic it's a great chapter which really gets into the nitty-gritty of german politics and political economy i don't think a trick is missed it's really it's beautifully done um but i still end up kind of puzzled i'm still not sure i really i really get it because um there's a story here basically of neoliberal reform and to put it crudely a huge shock to the ex post income and distribution. In a society unlike China, which is already deeply capitalist, has a profoundly unequal wealth distribution, which is diagnosing itself in the late 1990s as stuck, right? And yet somehow it energizes something, somebody, some group of people energize Germany into this change, into this shift. It's a much less fluid situation than the one in China that Michael has just outlined for us so brilliantly. So how do we understand what gives, what shifted, what broke the reform impasse in Germany? And reading your chapter, Matt, it's like, I'm, I'm, you know, how do you see it is my question. Because you talk sometimes about the role of ideology. You talk sometimes about the role of key elite figures. Then you take us to the income and the wealth distribution and show, look, these are the people who benefited. 
how does this add, does this add up to you to a coherent picture of Verteilungskampf, muscle fractures, the title of muscle fractures book of class war, or is there some more complicated thing going on here? I, I completely, first of all, thank you. I appreciate the, the kind words. I know you and I talked about this before when I was writing and trying to figure out, you know, what happened and why. And I, I agree it's a mix of, of all the things you, you mentioned, that there was an ideological component that it's very hard to understand why the choices are made without that. But there was also, I think, other forces as well. So it's, you know, the reforms of the early 2000s get a lot of attention, and rightly so. And by reforms, we're really meaning essentially welfare cuts for most people, cuts to unemployment benefits and, and so forth. Changes, let's call them. Changes, the great yeah, changes. Change or something, the great um, break. But a lot of the developments, a lot of those changes were preceded by changes that occurred in the private sector in the 1990s. And that was really, sometimes those were coordinated by local governments, including um, in Lower Saxony, where Gerhard Schroeder came from before he became uh, chancellor, but a lot of it was done at sort of the business and union level. Yeah. And, and the two are linked because Lower Saxony owns VW, or is a key right. shareholder in VW, yes. and so they have an industrial... Right. And the Hartz reforms, which have the name, comes from Peter Hartz, who was the head of HR at Volkswagen, who knew Schroeder from the 90s. And you know, during this period, a lot of what happened, you know, the belief was shared on both sides, really, that the only way to preserve employment was through a combination of wage and hour cuts, and that mm. there wasn't really an alternative in terms of domestic you know, growth. And I think a lot of this, a lot of it, I think, has to come from our understanding of the way journey unification occurred. And, you know, whether you talk about the mistakes that occurred or what have you, but essentially, the belief at the time was that there was going to be this incredible boom because you had people who, you know, they spoke the same language, they had a shared history, you know, they weren't, they'd been behind the Iron Curtain for 45 years, but that wasn't forever. And so the idea was that if you bring in West German technology, West German management, West German capitalism and democracy, you'd have, you know, an incredible growth story. It would be, you know, boom times as you get this convergence trade. And for a variety of reasons, it didn't work out that way. And a lot of people ended up losing money, including the German government mm -hmm. that was sort of underwriting this whole process. And that, I think soured a lot of people on, you know, sort of the outlook of, of business and and also what fiscal policy could do. So one of the things that was done at the beginning, um, in part to discourage, one of the things they were concerned about was this massive wave of migration from east to west. Mm -hmm. And, you know, because essentially people in the west were afraid they'd have to be essentially subsidizing people who'd moved. And then they were also worried that everyone who stayed behind, you know, there'd just be a sort of rump state that would be, you know, unable to function economically. Mm -hmm. And one of the ways that they tried to prevent this was by extending the yeah. German, West German social security system to the east. So yeah. basically, if you worked at an East German enterprise that was now defunct, you'd be eligible for West German style unemployment benefits and, and retirement and all that good stuff. And the idea was that therefore you'd have less incentive to leave. Of course, that puts pressure on the future of those systems as things start working out, and you get, you know, sort of the Germans, Germany's sort of conservative core in the in the rich Southwest, you know, the Munich, Frankfurt, Stuttgart area, they um, they come to advocate changes, reforms, okay. cuts, whatever you want to call it, to Germany's social security system as a way of essentially ending the transfers that they resent. To so there, I have my class actor. So basically, yours right. is a is a is a a vision of a strategy has gone terribly wrong. Whereas in fact, what I think you're now exposing for us is that trade wars are the result of development strategies pushed in the German case by this export oriented Southwest German elite who are struggling with the aftermath of the Cold War and trying to sort of piece together some solution. And that's what percolates up by way of the Red Green Coalition. Right. Um, we've just had a, I just, I'm, I'm tracking questions from the side here and, and one of them was about migration. And I think your point about German reunification is spot on. Um, really, reunification was a migration crisis. It's Germany's first great migration crisis of the late 20th century. The second is then the Yugoslav crisis of the late 90s, early, and then, of course, the famous Merkel crisis of 2015. I'm, I'm hustling us along because I want, I want to move to the big picture and then open it up. The consequence of this is that in your story, you have these two surplus generating countries, China and Germany, with class factions and development strategies, which push them into these unbalanced macro positions, which generate current account surpluses and capital flows that match that. And on the receiving end of this is the United States. And one of the sort of really eye-opening moments in the book is you say, and yes, dear reader, this means what this sounds as though it means, which is that America doesn't control its current account. It doesn't control its net overall macroeconomic savings balance. And that is 
massively explosive. And I, I, you know, there's one aspect that you really punch up and one that is a little more buried, but it would be great to hear. You. One is clearly that the twin deficit story, which has haunted reformist, centrist, democratic politics since the Clinton era, is bogus, right? Because America's current account balance does not fluctuate with the public sector deficit because the private sector surplus offsets it to a large extent. So that doesn't work, right? So in a sense, the inflow of foreign capital is what does the work. Um, the implication of that, though, is that in a sense, it's class wars in China and Germany that drive global imbalances. But oddly, class wars within the United States are broadly speaking neutral with regards to the US current account at the first cut. Anyway, there's a way in which you bring them back by way of Wall Street. But at the first cut, the huge surge in inequality, which is much more dramatic in the US than anywhere else, is largely offset within the American net surplus account, which is what then gives absolute primacy to the external flows on the US account. Insofar as inequality in the US drives your story, it's the particular focus on Wall Street as a mediator of foreign capital, which we know is a big part of the American inequality story, but only part of it. Um, is that is was that a fair reading in the sense that the the inequality problem is really other peoples which spills over into the United States and inside the U.S. the story is really a for you is a Wall Street story. So I think that's that's largely right in terms of looking at the balance of payments. Although I'd, I'd sort of add a couple of little clarifications there. One is that I mean we sort of the way we introduced the U.S. chapter just as a spoiler if people haven't read the book yet is that if you look at what happened in Germany in a lot of ways it resembles what happened to the U.S. over the same period whether that's it's welfare reform, passage. You know, yeah. uh, the tech bust leading yeah. to corporate investment yeah. collapsing, a lot of things similar. Uh, you know, underinvestment in infrastructure. So the question is, why did it end up differently? And so I think, to be fair, that that actually did have an impact on the U.S. current account. So I mean, if you want to compare the U.S. to say Spain, which did not have this sort of countervailing force, the current account, mm -hmm. the shift in the current account in Spain was about twice as large relative to the Spanish economy. So I think, you know, I'm not going to say that that quantitative relationship is something we can sort of pass through directly, but I think that sort of just looking at it qualitatively, that makes sense to me that that is because because Spain didn't have a mass increase in inequality because the Spanish government did use the opportunity to invest in things like its high speed rail network, as mm -hmm. well as airports in the middle of nowhere they shouldn't have built. Mm -hmm. um, that essentially led to a much larger change. And, uh, you know, there's actually a new paper that came out, you know, just earlier this year, we didn't have obviously a chance to incorporate in the book, but um, by Atif Mian and Amir Sufi and mm -hmm. Bubuk Straub, and they basically say like the savings glut of the rich in the US, it's something like half of it responsible about half of sort of the increase in, in domestic private debt in the US in the 2000s. The other half, of course, came from abroad. So there's like, you know, some elements. So some of that savings glut of the rich went abroad mm -hmm. from the US. Some of it was internally reinvested, which is different from what happened in uh, Germany, for example, which didn't really mm -hmm. have any kind of domestic debt or investment. Um, and then, you know, to what you're saying that the, the Wall Street element is important. There was a complementarity of interests of a lot of people, you know, the rich in the US and the rich in these other countries. Part of that shows up sort of obviously in the sense that to the extent that Chinese, China's development strategy in the beginning in particular involved attracting foreign investment technology. And that was very enthusiastically embraced by American, European, Japanese companies. And the other thing, of course, as you said, that if you're going to be a net producer of financial assets to sell to the rest of the world, then the people who are in the business of producing and selling financial assets to the rest of the world are going to be very enthusiastic about that kind of mm. economic system. But you do more or less explicitly say, and this is sort of one of the head turning moments, I mean, that you position the United States, maybe as victim is perhaps too strong a word, but barely too strong a word. You talk about the exorbitant burden, you actually say structurally, the United States finds itself in the position of the colonized world in the Hobsonian scheme. In other words, as the recipient of excess savings being produced in the advanced economies. Um, and there is a sense in which this is, you're, you're not explicit about it. You don't spend many pages discussing current American politics, but there is here either a powerful explanation or one could even think, read it as an apology for the protectionist turn of American politics in recent decades. In other words, apology in the sense that you are showing the hidden rationale, that there is in fact a hidden macroeconomic rationale to the desire of American policymakers to ward off other people's imbalances. 
Does that seem, is that fair? I, I think I, I'm, I'm, I'm probably going to try to reduce my, my participation here because I understand that there's a lot of echoes when I speak. So I'll let, I'll let uh, uh, Matt do a lot of the speaking. Um, but I think that that was the original insight which led to a lot of, uh, a lot of our subsequent uh, 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 structure. And that is that um, it's, it's a really simple balance of payments argument. If, if, if money flows into the US, then the US obviously runs a capital account surplus and it must run a current account deficit. And by definition, there must be a gap between American investment and American savings. And what we always hear, and this is implicitly part of the two deficit argument, is that this, this is used to fund uh, American investment. But when you just look around at the world, it's pretty clear that uh, the US and in fact any advanced economy doesn't really need foreign capital to fund investment. We're flooded with capital. Mm. Interest rates are at the lowest they've ever been in history. American companies before COVID-19 were sitting on huge piles of cash and weren't investing them. Some people say they were investing them in buybacks, but of course that's not investment. Um, so the argument was uh, inflows into the US had no impact on US investment, unlike in the 19th century where British capital actually caused American investment to go up. So therefore, it must be the case that savings goes down. And what we had to do was to figure out what are the mechanisms that drive down American savings. And I won't, I, I won't go into all the details, but they, basically, um, they can basically be divided into three groups. And that is uh, uh, mechanisms that force an increase in household debt Mm -hmm. mechanisms that force an increase in the fiscal deficit or mechanisms that force up the unemployment rate. All of mm -hmm. those have that impact. Now, you mentioned uh, uh, inequality because if the U.S. were like, were like other countries, the rise, rise in U.S. inequality would have forced an increase in the American save savings, which would have result resulted in American current account surplus, as, as was the case in, in Germany, Germany, or et cetera. That did happen. And we would argue the reason that can't happen, happen that happened was, was because of the very special role the, the U.S. plays in the global, the global balance of payments, to a lesser extent than the U.K. And that is, it is the automatic net, net recipient of excess savings in the, in the rest of the world. So as a result, the U.S. cannot control and troll its current account. The U.S. current account is the opposite of whatever the rest of the world needs to do, to do in terms of exporting savings. And uh, the, se the second corollary to that, to that is there the U.S. has no control over its savings rate. Mm -hmm. The savings, savings rate is really a function of, an, of, a, of a bunch of things. But if, if a foreign savings flow, flow in the U.S., or if the things of the rich rise because of the rise in income inequality, quality, both of those, those cannot, cannot increase total savings in the U.S. The total savings in the U.S. The US is equal to investment minus the current account mm. surplus. Yeah. So, so as something else must, must happen, which again is the same thing, a rise in household debt, a rise in the, in the fiscal debt, or a rise in unemployment. And then Matt mentioned the, the paper by uh, Amir Sufi and, and colleagues. And, and I really want to stress, if anyone, anyone hasn't read their most recent papers, really should. It, it's a very powerful argument, mm. basically leads in the same, same direction. Capital inflows and the increase in equality in the U.S. have the same impact on rising on rising in American debt. We're, we're, one, one, might, one, might, one might observe at an interesting historical moment in which Larry Summers himself has now come out in favour of the of the uh, workers' power as the or the the collapse in bargaining power of the American labour as a key variable driving the recent trajectory of macroeconomic history. I would be remiss if I didn't end by asking, as it were, the question uh, that follows, uh, what is to be done? Um, I, think, I think for me, uh, the question arises at two levels. Um, first, as it were, what technically, what, what are the prescriptions that follow? But I think given the way in which yours is a richly historical political economy, you also, and this is of course a, a, a fate which anyone who's serious about this is exposed to, you also lay yourself open to the question, so show me the social force 
show me the coalition of ideology uh, and interests and institutional momentum, which could realistically be thought to suggest some way out of here, because precisely because you have elaborated such a thick sociological political economy account of the forces making for this imbalance. In a sense, if we are to imagine a route out, it's not good enough simply to have a new blueprint of a new Bretton Woods, which we can all dream up. And it follows very, very immediately from what you've said. What, do you see any prospect of that kind of shift happening in a non-catastrophic way? Because one can presumably see the outline of a catastrophic resolution at this point. So one thing that's interesting, I mean, and Michael pointed this out already, but that in China, strictly speaking, a lot of the specific suggestions we have for things that the government could realistically do to alleviate this problem, whether it's improving the quality of social insurance or changing the household registration system, are things that the government has already committed itself to. The argument for pessimism is that because they've committed themselves to doing this for years and it hasn't happened yet in a way to really move the needle, it makes you sort of wonder if it's ever going to happen. But at least in yeah. principle, uh, that's something that the Communist Party leadership says that they're supporting. Yeah. So that's, you know, whether that's encouraging or not, I guess, depends on your interpretation. I think in Europe is really, there are some interesting things happening there. I mean, one of the things that I genuinely find surprising, and maybe, maybe I shouldn't have, I don't know, but that in reaction to the financial crisis and the euro crisis, that the net effect of that politically was basically obliteration of the center left yes. and the obliteration of any sort of pan-European left-wing movements, which is not sort of, I mean, that would not have been the, the obvious thought of it if you, just, you tell someone in advance that's sort of the, what was going to happen to the economy. But if that were to have changed, then, I mean, who knows? You know, you see saying, you know, there's sort of, a, you know, the, the sort of French, Spain, Italian coalition a little bit happening. The fact that there's this willingness, small but significant, of having the European Commission borrow on behalf yeah. of everyone else to spend and not spend proportion of the size of economy, but spending in proportion to where what which economies are getting harmed the most by mm -hmm. the coronavirus. I mean, that could be the beginning of, of something interesting. I mean, that's essentially what we would say, you know, would realistically help in terms of making Europe move in the direction that would be helpful. Um, you know, the other thing is that within Germany, and this is one point, you know, we make a little bit in the book is a lot of, you know, there's sort of two phases to this story. And that up until 2008, you really did see within sort of the private sector, this extreme increase in imbalances in, in terms of, you know, the rising profitability of companies, the expense of mm -hmm. you know, workers not having any income growth whatsoever. After 2008, it looks a little different. Mm -hmm. And essentially, there is some rebalancing within the private sector that's more than offset by changes in government fiscal policy. Mm -hmm in terms of higher, relatively high taxes and relatively low spending. So to the extent that the private sector rebalancing is sustained and the extent that fiscal policy in Germany changes, which it seems like it might, but you know that in and of itself would do a tremendous amount of good as well. Um, Jack, uh, how do we want to move to Q&A? Uh, do we have a means of taking questions? Are we gonna do it through the chat? What's the idea? Yeah, I think um, we already have a couple questions, or at least one question from YouTube, so we can start with that. And then while we're doing that question, if people want to just type in a very brief one sentence explanation of the question in the chat, and then I'll take them and unmute and call on people so they can ask it. Um, so the one that I see from, from YouTube um, is from Daniel Ospina, and he asks about the impact of um, low skilled immigration uh on your analysis um would you see that as complementary to the kind of uh, diagnosis of global imbalances that you're offering so i mean we don't mention that and i think the reason is because i don't think it really it really depends on what you mean by low-skilled immigration the, the big part of the book is that what matters is how much people are paid relative to the value of what they produce so if low-skilled immigrants are not afforded the same kinds of legal rights and protections and pay packages as people who already live in a place, then yes, that would have an impact. But the extent that they are integrated into society, and I mean, integrated into society in the sense that like, they're literally just subject to the same laws, um, mm -hmm. then I don't see why that would be the case. I mean, ultimately, you know, people produce and they also consume. And so unless there's some kind of systematic difference in, in savings mm -hmm. behavior of these people, which I don't see why that is. I mean, globally, you look at surveys across countries and people generally you know, their savings rates are, there's not a lot of variation. The thing that really matters is how much you earn to start with. So I don't see why that would really have an issue. I mean, if you have people who aren't having legal status and then are exploited as a consequence, that could have an impact, but that's very mm -hmm. different, I think, from what the question was. Mm 
So, I mean, I think the, the way in which I saw it figuring in your story was not really so much through immigration, but through um, outsourcing. So right. you were saying that, you know, it was a rather big shock to the confidence of the German business community that reunification went so badly. But that's, of course, only a rather small segment of the broader transformation of the post-communist world. And that went brilliantly. <laughs> you know, right. from the point of view of German business, the story in the Hungarys, the Polands, the right. Czechias, could not have gone better. I mean, they they bolted on. It was more dramatic than NAFTA in many ways, I think, in its implications, um, because the pay differential between Germany and Romania is every bit as large as that between the United States and Mexico. Um, uh, one of the questions that's being asked uh, insistently uh, on the line is, um, in your structure is built in a causal pattern in which the work is being done by Germany and China and America becomes, as it were, in a perverse way, the object of other people's pressure. What is the role for domestic transformation in the United States? Is there any means through which the question is posed in terms of class struggle? How could one shift the balance of the class struggle in the United States so as to shift the terms of this, of this imbalance? Is there, is there a way out that way. Here's where I'm, I'm a little pessimistic because I would argue that in, in the current environment, the, the argument against increasing wages is a, is a pretty strong argument. And that is higher wages means a reduction of productivity, I'm sorry, of competitiveness. And a reduction of competitive means that the benefits of higher wages will simply flow abroad. So if you pay your workers more, um, then consumers in your country will end up consuming from abroad because, of course, prices have to rise. Uh, so if, if, you, if you believe that, if you believe the problem is, is you know, really sort of a massive beggar thy neighbor problem in which every country improves its relative position by putting downward pressure on wages, either directly, like, like Germany perhaps did under the Hartz reforms, or indirectly through weak currencies or through subsidies, et cetera, then it's very, very difficult to, to raise wages. And in fact, you get in a competitive position in which each country benefits by lowering wages and so lowering its, its contribution to global demand, but then taking a bigger share of whatever is left. Um, so it would seem to me that if you really want to address the problem of wages, and to me, migration is simply an extension of that problem, um, then perhaps we have to take steps to prevent the, um, the, I would argue that we really should take steps to prevent the, the flow of capital, the unfretted flow of capital. Uh, we need some sort of protection, but rather than trade protection, I would argue that we go back to what both Keynes and Harry Dexter White agreed, which is that there's really no good argument for unfettered international capital flows. And I think, um, I, I think we probably need to impede them. Just to add on Matt, a, little yeah. bit, a little bit to that, one of the things we talk about is essentially a trade-off that countries face or governments face, whatever, um, between your ability to manage your external imbalance in terms of the current account deficit, your ability to manage your own domestic inequality. So the US, for example, could have you know address its own inequality issues but then because of that you know as michael says that means you're going to have a lot of extra spending on foreign goods that's not necessarily a problem but it will lead it could lead to a lot of higher debt if the, and then you get the question of how that debt is, is absorbed and so forth and that that's essentially is that a sustainable model for the united states much less other countries uh to follow and so that creates a bit of a you know, a challenge. Obviously, if there are surplus um, in a surplus society, there's much, you know, there's less cost. Like if you're Germany and you have a, you know, 8% of GDP current account surplus, there's really nothing for anyone to lose out on meaningfully uh, if you have higher domestic demand. But for a country such as the US, you could imagine there being, you know, a view of, of those trade offs. Yeah, presumably one solution would be, and you, you, you canvass it for the huge inflow of foreign capital to have been channeled into safe public debt, which would have been then used wisely on a large infrastructure program and upskilling the American labor force and creating demand specifically for American manufacturers. And that would have, as it were, closed the circle. It would then have left you with an escalating American debt burden, but let's park that as a problem. Um, but that would have required a fact, radically different politics right, in the US. In fact, Adam, it wouldn't be a problem because no. if, if, if the US were to invest productively in infrastructure, and God knows the U.S. has infrastructure yeah. needs. Yeah. 
then the debt would rise, but yeah. the debt burden would actually decline. So yeah, the only thing is it's hard to argue that the U.S. should embark on, a, on an infrastructure building program because foreigners have uh, insufficient or, or because foreigners have excess savings. That's a completely separate political issue. Should the U.S. do it? Yes, clearly it should. Should it do it because the rest of the world has excess savings? No, it should do it for domestic reasons. So, assuming, yeah, right. assuming you could neutralize the negative effects of the rest of the world's excess savings on the United States, right? Which, as you've suggested, you, one might do by way of capital controls. Right. I mean, another thought that came to mind is just negative interest rates. I mean, why, uh, you know, you could have some sort of penalty rate, which made it, you know, at least the Americans would receive a service. I have, I, we're really running close to time. And I want to just introduce one final factor, um, because it's been asked insistently on the panel and, and by Perry Merling in particular. In the background of this argument is, are a set of assumptions and, 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 and arguments about the position of the dollar, right, in the global system. I mean, that's ultimately what, what makes this unstable structure possible, difficult to escape is the the safe asset provider is the US. Is that is that a is that a, a, yeah. a, a fair reading? Do you, um, wanna, do you wanna deal with that, Matt? Matt sure, yeah. I mean, we, we cite Perry's work uh, in, in that section. So yes, I mean, that's definitely the case. I mean, essentially the dollar became predominant after you know, World War II. And at that point in time, the US was equivalent to about the entire rest of the world in terms of economic output. And now the US is still the world's largest economy, but relative to the rest of the world, the rest, you know, it's about a third of the size as it was when the dollar was, you know, the arc, you know, the sort of cornerstone of the mm -hmm. global financial system. So that means that the relative cost of absorbing the rest of the world's imbalances, which essentially is what happens when your currency is the global currency, has gone up by, you know, three times. And that means, you know, I don't have any prediction of whether the U.S. is going to continue to shrink relative to the rest of the world. But even if it doesn't, you know, it's clearly much harder. And we've seen it already just in the past few decades that the cost of that is extremely high in the U.S. And it's not clear the U.S. domestic political system is capable of finding a response to it. So, you know, it would be nice if there were alternatives. And, and you know, actually, in theory, the euro should have been an alternative. And there, you know, we talk about reasons why it sort of didn't really pan out that way. But that could change in the extent that there is sort of a multi currency architecture that might, you know, or quite frankly, as, as Michael was saying, you just have much higher limits on cross-border financial flows than and the need for this kind of global currency and the, and the extent to which the dollar is a burden on the U.S. or affects, you know, other people's use of the dollar affects conditions in the U.S. that should go down. So I guess to, to wrap things up, because we're, 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 we're over time now already, I guess the question is, um, is it conceivable that, that, as it were, a concerted coalition of thinkers disposed to the kind of argument that you've made and many other people on this call would obviously agree with, a, a political force, an institutional project that could emerge in the United States that would actually gain some leverage over and some traction on this problem? Because there have been moments historically where American progressive politics was willing to tangle with the money question, was, was willing to ask serious questions about the Fed and its role, was willing to ask serious questions about Wall Street. Um, in a sense, one could read your book as a manifesto for that kind of politics. I mean, there is legislation about financial controls in the US and Michael can probably talk about that more and and, and uh, but yeah I mean it's it's certainly plausible that people could coalesce around that argument it doesn't have sort of a obvious you know left right tinge so maybe there could be a you know broader you know appeal both in the US and, and quite frankly in other countries as well where it's really an issue such as you know Europe and, and so forth yeah the uh, the good news I think is that this isn't the first time we've faced this problem um, periods of significant income inequality in the U.S. included the uh, 1830s, uh, the 1860s, the period before World War I, which was resolved by World War I, uh, the 1920s. And in each case, the U.S., in a very, very messy, chaotic way, took the necessary political steps that ended up in a major redistribution of income. Mm. Um, and I suspect that maybe we're going through that process again, a very chaotic, messy way we are, we've reached the limits of our ability to absorb rising income inequality, at least that's what I hope. But what we do know from history is that it always gets resolved. The problem is it often gets resolved through war, through massive uh, uh, bankruptcies, 
uh, or through political redistribution. And what I'm hoping, of course, is that we do it in the latter way. Well, that seems like, uh, uh, if not exactly an optimistic note, nevertheless, uh, as it were, a future orientated note on which to conclude this truly fascinating conversation. Thank you very much for this book. It's really a treat. It's wonderfully elegant. It's great fun. Even if you feel Even that you you know know the score of political economy, you will benefit from uh, reading this book. As I say, the German chapter alone is worth the price of entry. Um, get it, read it, engage with it. I'm sure this argument is going to run and run. Um, I do think it's agenda setting for thinking about America's position in global political economy in our current moment. Thank you very much uh, to Jack. Okay, and I, the team I, for I have to have to, uh, I have to interrupt before before Jack does. I'm really, really delighted to hear you say that um, because you have because you have written what I is probably the, the best book I've read in the last 20 years. So hearing that from you makes me feel very, feel very good. <laughs> it's this is a this is a really important argument. People have got to get to grips with. You all knew that from Michael and Matt anyway, but they've they've come they've come through. This is really a good read. Thanks so Thank you everyone so much um, for coming. Please buy the book. Um, the link should be in your inboxes. Um, somewhere. Um, and please, if uh, you want to sign up for the JFI newsletter, um, you'll get information about future events and we'll have uh, documentation of this an edited transcript published on the blog Phenomenal World, hopefully sometime next week. Thank you so much, Adam, Michael, and Matt. This has been really incredible. Greatly appreciate your time. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>